you've ever read something on social media and been surprised to discover that one of the things you do regularly is actually a symptom of anxiety, then this video is for you. I'm gonna be talking about the everyday behaviors and responses that get attributed to our anxiety and discussing whether or not they actually are. Oh, and spoiler warning, most of them aren't. I'm Tim Box, and this is five things we get told are anxiety symptoms that actually are not. So welcome back to my channel, or if this is your first time, I'm Tim Box, I'm a mind coach. And for the last 12 years or so, I've been working with people to help them overcome all sorts of emotional and psychological issues. And in particular, helping people to get control of anxiety. One of the things that often sets people back in their recovery is being told that some of the everyday rituals or behaviors they engage in are actually a symptom of their anxiety issue. That leaves us thinking that we won't be fully recovered until we stop doing these things. As a result, we end up desperately fighting our natural behaviors and habits and stressing ourselves out when changing them proves to be a struggle. Certain behaviors we engage in have inevitably started as a way of coping with anxious feelings and thoughts, but it's often a mistake to then label them as a symptom of an ongoing anxiety issue. In this video, I'll be explaining how not all behaviors we attribute to anxiety issues are inherently negative, and how recovery doesn't depend on changing all aspects of the day-to-day -day routine we developed to cope with anxiety. So without further ado, here are five things you might have been told were an indicator of an anxiety issue, which are actually pretty normal. So we might as well start with the one that inspired this video. The other day I saw a social media post someone had put up saying she didn't realize that her love of watching old TV shows or movies that she's seen before is a sign of anxiety. The explanation given was that we re-watch these shows because we know how they end and thus there's no danger of getting anxious whilst we watch them. The comments were full of people who had their minds blown to discover that they actually suffered with anxiety and hadn't even realized it. Why were there so many comments from people that could relate to this? Because watching our favorite shows over and over again is something that the vast majority of human beings do. It's not a sign of struggle, it's that thing of wanting to repeatedly re-engage with pleasurable experiences. It's important that we distinguish between doing something because we fear the alternative and doing something just because we enjoy it. As a result of that post, there are people waking up today believing they might have anxiety issues when they actually don't. Rest assured, it's okay to re-watch your favorite episode of Friends without feeling like you're displaying symptoms of an emotional disorder. Also, I've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark about 40 times and it never stops being exciting. Remember when Steve Jobs told us that the reason he always wears a black turtleneck is because wearing the same thing each day simplifies his process? Well, I had a client point out to me recently that I had some good anxiety coping strategies in place. I asked what they meant and they said, well, you always wear the same outfit. The point being that it simplified my daily mental process by reducing the amount of decisions I needed to make every day and thus protected me from potential overwhelm. Now, there's a couple of things to say about this. Firstly, I have loads of different outfits. Yes, perhaps they all look incredibly similar, but they are subtly different. Secondly, simplifying any part of your daily process doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anxiety. It's simply good time and resource management. I might have suffered with high anxiety in the past, but the way I got past that didn't involve my wardrobe choices. Imagine if everything we did to simplify our process, we were then told was an indicator of an anxiety issue. Also, if I'm being honest, in my case, it might just be a sign of a lack of imagination when it comes to getting dressed in the morning. But it's probably worth mentioning, simplifying your mental process can be a step worth taking when it comes to managing your mental health. If you feel reducing your wardrobe options would help you personally feel less overwhelmed, then go for it. But rest assured, if you do naturally have quite a narrow and defined fashion sense, that doesn't mean you have anxiety issues. It might just mean you're quite stylish. 
I've lost count of the amount of clients I've seen who tell me that one of the things they wanna get rid of is the water bottle that they carry around with them. It's an extremely common pattern of behavior when we become anxious about falling ill, getting sick or passing out that we constantly have a bottle of water in our hand so we don't become dehydrated and unwell. It can often become a bit of a crutch for us. There's nothing wrong with recognizing this and realizing that an indicator of a positive change would be the day we just forget to take it with us and then feel okay about that. That moment where we realize we no longer require a crutch can be a fantastic and liberating moment. However, I've lost count of the times people have said to me that they still like to bring a water bottle out with them because, you know, staying hydrated is a good thing, but feel they shouldn't because it would mean they haven't fully recovered. Before you know it, they're feeling anxious whenever they start to feel thirsty, questioning what they should do for the best. A good way of defining between an unwanted coping strategy and a simple preference is to ask yourself if it would matter that much if you left the bottle at home. It's not about whether or not you're doing the thing, it's about whether or not you for some reason feel like you need to do the thing. I'll often mention in these videos that a sign of unprocessed thoughts or experiences can be the inability to sit in a room that is completely silent. Life is fine when we have our distractions and tasks that keep us busy, but when we just sit, be still and listen to what our mind is saying, sometimes we find it saying things we don't really want to hear. This is why we need the TV on or our music playing. It drowns out the negative thoughts. However, I had a client once who used to like to listen to music when they were out and about shopping or going to and from work. She recognized that this was partially because it protected her from the random loud noises of the city that might startle her and cause her to feel a little overwhelmed and anxious. Her therapist had highlighted this as a coping strategy in response to high anxiety, and when she had recovered, she wouldn't need to do this anymore. So far, so good. However, even as this client recovered, and one of the reasons this person then became my client was because her therapist was insisting she stop listening to music while she was out and about, as it indicated she was still unwell. There can be a lot of reasons why we listen to music, and this client recognized that she had always enjoyed listening to it as she traveled wherever she was going. Yes, it had served an extra purpose when she was experiencing high anxiety and helped her manage her perceived triggers, but now she was hugely confused about whether or not she was allowed to listen to music at all. If she had the thought to put her favorite tunes on, does this mean she's still struggling? Does preferring the sound of music to the sounds in the street mean she hasn't yet recovered? These thoughts just caused more anxiety and stalled her recovery. It's inevitable that when we were struggling, we looked to familiar positive activities to help us feel safe. That doesn't mean we have to then abandon those habits when we start to feel well again. My advice was to do whatever puts a smile on your face when you travel to work in the morning. It's certainly true that if we're suffering bouts of social anxiety, then we have a limit to how much time we can spend in the company of others before we start to become overwhelmed and exhausted. The constant state of high anxiety and the mild fight or flight mode we go into in these circumstances can cause us to tire and need to be alone to recharge. And by the way, for more advice on social anxiety issues, then check out my video about that for a detailed breakdown of how we deal with it. However, it's important to remember that needing to duck out of the party early does not mean you have an anxiety issue. You might legitimately not be enjoying the company, you might be tired today, or you might well just be an introvert. If you're naturally introverted, that has nothing to do with how outgoing or outspoken you are. It simply means that you recharge your energies by being alone. By contrast, Extroverts feed off of the energy of other people and thrive in social situations. You know those people who really struggled during lockdown these past couple of years? The ones that have never experienced high anxiety before? That means they're probably extroverts. Isolating did not sit well with them. And those people that were perfectly happy on their own without having to see so many people, that's your introverts. When I started to get the other side of my social anxiety, it was a constant cause of confusion that I still preferred being alone or in very small groups to being at bigger social events. It had me questioning whether I was doing as well as I thought I was. Turns out it didn't mean I was struggling at all. I felt a lot better when I realized and accepted that for whatever reason, it was just in my nature to be more introverted. 
Before you allow someone else to tell you that the behavior you're displaying means you have an anxiety issue, and before you label yourself in a way that could potentially restrict your growth, recognize that what you're doing is much less important than why you're doing it. There can be a number of reasons why we choose to do something. It's only really if our decision is based on fear that we might wanna look into that. If we're doing something we enjoy, like re-watching our favorite film, or something we feel is always a good idea, like staying hydrated, then we don't need to second guess what that means. We certainly don't need to base our choices or behaviors on what other people decide is okay. But now it's over to you. What do you do that you've been told or have read somewhere is an anxiety symptom, but you're pretty sure is just something you do? Also, I'm thinking of doing a video on those less common anxiety symptoms and how we might more effectively manage them. So let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that one. Okay, so I hope this video has been of value. And if you have any questions, then put them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer all of them. Please hit that thumbs up button if you like what I do and why not subscribe to the channel for weekly mind management tips and anxiety advice. But that's it for now. I'm Tim Box, Mind Coach. Always remember to be kind to your mind and I'll see you next time.